Okay, we're in session 8 and we're in part B. So we're in the last part of the last session. And now we're going to be talking about this subject called faith. <clears throat> and I have to suggest during this short break, I got some type of a tickle in my throat, so you may hear me cough or have to take a sip of water occasionally. <clears throat> and I apologize for that. Author of Hebrews says, without faith it is impossible to please God. Why is faith necessary to please God? And what exactly is faith? We're going to look at this. <clears throat> One of the things I did in uh, preparing uh, materials for writing the book, but also uh, in my own spiritual journey when I wanted to uh, find out more about uh, the Christian uh, faith, um, beliefs, foundation, I went through the gospel record and I decided to define faith by looking at every incident where Jesus uses that word faith. And I wanted to find out what can I learn from Jesus concerning what this faith is. <clears throat> Not as the word means in the secular world, but as it means biblically. And um, there's a lot of examples of this. I won't cover them all here, uh, but many of them are in the book. But we begin as part of the teachings, uh, starting in Matthew uh, 5, which we call the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus is telling the people around him, don't worry, don't be anxious. And he reminds them about the provisions of God. If that is how God clothes the grasses of the field, which is here today and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? So here we see the word faith seems to relate to a person's trust in God and the assuredness that God is watching over them just like he watches over the lilies of the field, that he's going to protect and provide. And so Paul says, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourself is a gift of God. So not only is there this element of trust involving faith, faith itself comes from God. That's a very, very important point to know. Faith is not something we develop over time. It's not something we conjure up. It's a gift. The method God has chosen to bestow his grace upon the believer is through faith. That's why the author of Hebrews can say without faith, we can't please God. God saves us by his grace, which is the blood of Christ, through the faith that he gives us. And we should hammer this home. Faith is a gift. It's a gift from God. We've just finished talking about the fruit of the Spirit. One of the fruit of the Spirit, we translate it faithfulness, but it's the Greek word for faith. Uh, God gives us faith, and that's part of what the Spirit is doing through us. Paul <clears throat> writes in Romans 12:3. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but think of yourself with sober judgment according to the measure of faith God has given you. Faith comes from God. So let's look at other, tra uh, other areas where we see faith um, according to how it gets translated. Matthew 8, starting verse 6. Gentile approaches Jesus, <clears throat> not just any Gentile, he's a Roman centurion, he's an enemy of the Jewish people, he's an occupier, he's not a friend to the Jew, and yet he approaches this Jewish rabbi, this Jewish teacher, Lord, my servant lies at home paralyzed and is in terrible agony, Jesus says, I'll go and heal him. The centurion answered, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof. Now, he may have understood back then Jews did not enter the homes of Gentiles. That would make them unclean. But he understands something else. This is a Roman centurion. He's the officer who has authority over soldiers. All he has to do is say something and the soldier will respond. 
For I myself am a man under authority, with soldiers under me. I tell one to go, and he goes, another to come, and he comes. I tell the servant to do something, the servant does it. What he's implying is, Jesus, I know you have authority, and so you don't have to come to my home. All you have to do is speak the word, and my servant will be healed. And Jesus says, <clears throat> truly, I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. So Jesus is telling those around him, mainly Jews, God's chosen people, that this centurion, this Roman, this Gentile, he has great faith. And what has made this centurion so different? Note the complete confidence he has in Jesus. Jesus doesn't have to leave Capernaum. He doesn't have to visit the servant. He doesn't have to pray over the servant, touch the servant. All he has to do is speak the word and the servant will be healed. Centurion goes to Jesus. He puts his faith and trust in Jesus. He knows Jesus can produce the desired healing. And Jesus is defining that as commendable faith. So we see se several elements here. <clears throat> the author of Hebrews helps us answer the question, what is faith? He defines faith. Now, faith is the assurance of what we hope for and the certainty of what we do not see. That centurion had that type of faith. He was assured that Jesus could heal that sick servant. This was something he hoped for, and he was certain Jesus could do it. It would seem faith commingles itself with human confidence. God gives us faith, but we have a choice as to how much we're going to accept, how we're going to appropriate it. Uh, this is true with the fruit of the Spirit. God gives us love and joy and peace. But we can diminish our joy. We can diminish our love. Uh, we we uh, may not express our love toward one another. We have control over this, as it were. And so the level of faith we have, how much we trust God, that is a choice. The book, uh, a 40-day study on sin, salvation, sanctification has a number of stories from the New Testament. I'll just summarize by saying there are the common themes of putting our trust in Jesus. Most importantly, putting that trust into action. There's an element of obedience, an element of action associated with biblical faith. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> it's a pretty amazing story. Jesus sends the disciples out amongst the people and he tells the disciples, drive out demons. This is Matthew 10. And after this short-term mission trip, they come back and they're all excited. Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. So they're trusting in the power that Jesus has given them. They have faith in this, and they're obedient to Jesus. They're beginning to understand who Jesus is. Now, I want us to think about Matthew 16 and 17 and put all of this in context. In Matthew 16, that's where uh, the disciples go up north to Caesarea Philippi. That's a pagan worship site. That's where Jesus turns and says, who do you think I am? That's where Peter steps forward and says, you are the son, you're, you're the Messiah, you are the Christ, you are the son of the God who gives life, or the son of the living God. And Jesus says, okay, now I got to go to Jerusalem and die. And of course, this is really going to put a lot of pressure on their faith and trust. But right after this, Matthew 17, we have the transfiguration. And Peter is one of the ones fortunate enough to take part in that glorious glorification uh, and witness Jesus as Messiah. So Peter has all reasons on earth to trust Jesus and have faith in Jesus. There's no doubts who Jesus is. But still in Matthew 17, note what happens after the transfiguration. 
When they came to the crowd, a man came up to Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son. He has seizures. He's suffering terribly. He often falls into fire. He falls into water. And by the way, I brought him to your disciples. They couldn't heal him. What, what's going on? Earlier we saw they were able to cast out demons and do all sorts of miraculous things. Here they can't. And this is after they've declared Jesus as Messiah and after some of them have been able to witness the transfiguration. Jesus approaches the boy, rebukes the demon, and we are told that the boy, quote, was healed from that moment. The disciples then approach Jesus. Why couldn't we drive it out? Now, we need to look at the entire verse. Afterwards, so after all of this commotion has settled down, the disciples come to Jesus privately, and they ask, why couldn't we drive it out? I believe human nature. They have lost something. They're embarrassed. They can't figure this out, and so they come to Jesus privately. Note how Jesus responds. They say, why couldn't we drive this demon out? Jesus says, because you have so little faith. Now, <clears throat> the disciples have been with Jesus from the beginning of his ministry. They've seen him feed 5,000. They've seen him calm storms. They've seen him cast out demons. They recognize him as Messiah. Peter was uh, able to see the transfigured Lord and Savior. But here, after all of this, they're powerless because they have such little faith. I want to <clears throat> interject something here that I didn't make slides for, but I think it's important. Keep reading in Matthew 17, because there's a very interesting story. Uh, some tax collectors come up, uh, they're looking for tax money, and Peter goes to Jesus and says, hey, we need to have money to pay these taxes. Now we know Jesus could have said, here's, here's the money. But Jesus doesn't do this. He does something extremely weird. He said, okay, Peter, look, I'll tell you what. I want you to go all the way down to the shore of the Sea of Galilee and, and grab a fishing line and throw a fishing line in and you're going to catch a fish. Pull that fish up and once you got the fish up, take the hook out and open the fish's mouth. There you're going to find the tax money. Now, why on earth would Jesus do this? The Bible doesn't tell us, but I have my own surmising that I can do. I think Jesus is wanting to put Peter's faith to practice. He has this very ridiculous assignment for Peter so that Peter can understand, you know something, whatever Jesus tells me to do, I'm going to do it. And Peter does follow through with Jesus' commands. His faith is being built, his trust is being built, his obedience is being built. <clears throat> and those are three of the components of faith, of belief, of trust, of obedience. Now I want to close out with another thing that comes to us that might sound weird. It begins in Luke 18, starting with the first verse. It goes by a couple of names. It could be either the uh, parable of the persistent widow or the parable of the unjust judge. <clears throat> we'll begin reading. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray at all times and not lose heart. Remember that. We'll come back to that. In a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected men. And there was a widow in that town who wept, who kept appealing to him, give me justice against my adversary. <clears throat> we need to understand, uh, first century, ancient Near East, widows and orphans were absolutely helpless. They were the most vulnerable in society. Um, Think about this when you read the story of Ruth, and uh, Ruth and Naomi are widows. The importance of Naomi to return to her family, um, and how wonderful Boaz is to care for this Moabite woman, Ruth. 
um, uh, these, these two were, were widows, uh, totally helpless. And that's the situation here. Here's this uh, widow coming to this judge. He's not a righteous judge. He's an unrighteous judge. And she's wanting justice and she's persistent. The parable goes on for a while. <clears throat> the judge refused, but later he said to himself, though I neither fear God nor respect men, yet because this widow keeps pestering me, I will give her justice. Then she will stop, we translate it, wearing me out. The Greek is more like, uh, she'll stop breaking my arm. She'll stop beating up on me uh, with her perpetual requests. And the Lord said, listen to the words of the unjust judge. Will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry out, cry out to him day and night? Will he continue to defer their help? I tell you, he will promptly carry out justice on their behalf. Nevertheless, and this is the relationship with our subject matter. When I return, when the Son of Man comes, will I find faith on earth? Very provocative question. What's happening? Why, why ask, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? Now, I said this earlier, but I'm going to re-emphasize it. Whenever you're trying to analyze a parable, you have to take it in context. Find out who's being taught. After all, a parable is a teaching. Uh, what is Jesus trying to teach them? You have to look at the context. And our context <clears throat> goes to the preceding chapter, Luke 17. But before we go to Luke 17, we need to remind ourselves in Matthew 12, Jesus has performed a miracle. They claim he's doing it under the power of Satan. Jesus says, if I drive out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom, the reign, the rule of God has come upon you. Now, he is driving out demons by the Spirit of God. The kingdom of God is present. But the Pharisees do not understand this. They've witnessed what Jesus has done. They've heard his teachings. But they're looking for this Davidic king who's going to sit on David's throne and get rid of the Romans. Uh, they, they're not looking for this Isaiah 53 suffering servant. And so they're not placing their trust in Jesus. They're not believing Jesus. Uh, they're not obeying Jesus. Uh, they have no faith in Jesus. Now, while Jesus is not their king, some of the people are placing their faith in Jesus. They are placing Jesus on the throne of their lives. They're giving their allegiance to Jesus. They're obeying Jesus. They're putting their trust in Jesus. The rule of God, the reign of God, is being established on earth as it is in heaven. The kingdom of God is in their midst. The Pharisees lack this faith. All the terms we use in defining faith are missing. By the way, I asked the question, where is America in this equation? I'll let you think about that later on. But back to the parable. Jesus will tell the Pharisees that to ex uh, what to expect when he returns. That's Luke 17, he talks about those who will not be people of faith. He compares it to the days of Noah. He says in Luke 17, 27, people were eating and drinking, marrying and being given in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. Then the flood came and destroyed them all. He'll use this term, destroy them all, a second time. <clears throat> He'll talk about the days of Sodom and Gomorrah. It was the same in the days of Lot. People were eating and drinking, buying and selling, planning and building. In other words, normal activities. But on the day Lot left Sodom, fire and brimstone rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. When Jesus returns, things are going to appear normal. People are going to be eating and drinking and marrying. But God's judgment, God's condemnation, God's wrath will come. And so now we can put all of this and the concept of faith into context. We began Luke 18, 1. Then Jesus told them a parable about their need to pray at all times and not lose heart. 
he's referring to the end times and all that's going to happen. The parable is about a persistent widow and an unjust judge. The people are going to face injustice. And just like the widow, they're going to be helpless and hopeless unless they have faith, of course. The judge in the parable ultimately gives in to their wish wishes and ultimately justice does occur, just like what's going to happen in the end times when the Son of Man comes. Jesus says, will not God bring about justice for his elect, that's you and I, who cry out to him day and night? This is going back to the verse one, their need to pray at all times and not lose heart. Will he continue to defer their help? I tell you, he will promptly carry out justice on their behalf. He's drawing a comparison. If an uncaring, overly bothered, uncompassionate, annoyed, ungodly judge eventually answers with justice, how much more will a loving and caring Holy Father give to us, his children? How much more will he do what is right for his children? And so Jesus is saying, do you believe this? Do you place your trust in God? Will they be obedient to God even though there are perilous times? And that's what leads him to say, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on earth? And of course, depending upon when he returns, you and I may be the ones that answer that question. Faith is a gift from God. It includes intellectual affirmation and belief, but there's more to it than this. James, the half-brother of Jesus, says, you believe that God is one good for you, even the demons believe and shudder. Faith includes a component of belief, but that's not all that it includes. So the reverse can also be said. Belief requires faith. There's an action component of faith, just like the centurion. James writes, but someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. Now, here's where people get confused. We're not talking about salvation. That equation's already been solved for us. We're talking about our life in Christ, our our progressive sanctification as we strive to become more like Christ. We're now talking about the fruit of the Spirit, and one of them is faith. Are we appropriating that faith, or are we diminishing our faith? We've already said faith in greed it, it includes the component of trust, it includes belief, and it includes obedience. But someone will say, you have faith and I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds and I will show you my faith by my deeds. Our actions display our trust in God. And now we can go back to that definition in Hebrews. Now faith, faith is the assurance of what we hope for and the certainty of what we do not see. Our actions reveal whether or not we trust God. Whether or not we truly believe God is faithful He's able, that God is a God we can put our lives into, our trust into, our obedience toward. And so the author of Hebrews says, let us fix our eyes upon Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. We place our trust in God. We put our trust in his promises. Most importantly, we place our trust in the blood of Christ and the completed work of the cross. We do not doubt the ability of Jesus to save us. We fix our eyes upon Jesus. We are obedient in our faith. Our allegiance is to the King. We allow the Holy Spirit within us to transform us into becoming more like Christ, more like the one we serve. We become more like our Savior, but he's also our Lord. He is our King. The visible manifestation that we are people of faith is our obedience. 
All of this comprises biblical faith. And so the author of Hebrews can tell us, without faith, it is impossible to please God. So again, we have belief, we have faith, we have trust, we have obedience. All of these things are part of what biblical faith means. Now, as we come to a close, I recognize most of you taking this course probably are part of God's elect. You've been born again. You are brothers and sisters in Christ. We've been adopted into his family. And I think it would be beneficial for us to share several truths that apply to us. I want to first focus on you and I. And I've told you how wonderful the book of Romans is, especially Romans when we get to chapter 8. But I went through Romans and I started looking at what are the promises that God has made to the believer. Let's, let's go through each one of these. We have been given Christ's righteousness. We talked about this. This is the imputation. We have been declared not guilty. This is that word justification. We've been redeemed. Romans 5.1, we have peace with God. We are saved from God's wrath. We have been reconciled to God. We are now able to live this new life. We are no longer enslaved to sin. We are released from the Old Testament law, the, the Mosaic uh, covenant, the Mosaic law. We now have no con condemnation. Remember, this is the bookends of the book of Romans, Romans uh, 8, 1. Excuse me, the bookends of Romans chapter 8. This is Romans 8, 1. We now have no condemnation whatsoever, none. We've been given the Holy Spirit. We've been adopted into God's family. We've been made children of God. We've been made heirs. In all that happens to us, God will ultimately use it for our good. And then the last of the bookends, 838 and 39, nothing, nothing whatsoever can separate us from God's love. We all owe all of this to the grace and to the love of our Father. We owe it to the sacrifice that Christ did voluntarily on behalf of you and I on the cross. And there's no greater love than the act that Christ did. And we also owe it to the Holy Spirit that brings us from spiritual death into eternal life, life as God intended it to be. Let's return to how we opened this whole series. I asked the question, why did Jesus come to earth? That's what I asked the young people at that gathering in the Colorado Rocky Mountain foothills. And we know why he came to earth. He came to earth this time around to die for you and I. Now, there may be those who don't yet belong to God's family. And you may be a little bit confused. Uh, am I elect or not? There's only one way to find out. <laughs> Ask the guy who decides. Go to the Father in prayer. And I would suggest you approach him in a manner worthy of your desire to be a part of his kingdom. Admit your unworthiness. The prayer does not have to be lengthy. We can go back to the, the Pharisee and the tax collector in the temple. That was a very short prayer. Uh, Lord, have mercy upon me, a sinner. That, that's the prayer you can share. And the Bible tells us those who call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. If, if you truly want God, to enter your life in the personage of the Holy Spirit, if you want all of the blessings of salvation, God will answer that prayer. Our study of sin, salvation, sanctification answered the question, why did Jesus come to earth? And I ask a second question. It was hypothetical. Suppose 
you are part of God's family and now you have died your physical death you're appearing before Jesus and he can ask you one question what would he ask and I answer it I don't think he's going to say did you read your Bible did you go to Sunday school uh, were you too anxious to leave church to go listen to the uh, Denver Broncos play football uh, I don't think he's going to talk about anything like that. I think he's going to put arms around you and say, did you ever realize while you were on my earth how much I truly loved you? I think that's what we need to focus on every single day of our lives. How much the Creator God loves us, what he's done for us, what this whole concept of salvation means. He died for us, for you and I. What more could we ask for? What more could he give us? And so as we close, I just want to pray that our resurrected Lord and Savior will bless you richly. Thank you for this participation in this series. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have.